Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark comments on the remarkable profits U.S. banks have seen. Armstrong Economics' Martin Armstrong talks about who would make the best U.S. president. He also has a strong stand on government finances. I mean, I'm against corporate and personal income tax anyhow. These things are barbaric relics from the past. Mackey Research's Peyton Nyquist wraps up the action on the Canadian senior and junior markets. Plus, we'll have the latest from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray right after this show. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. Our guest is Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Nice to be with you, Jim. The U.S. banks, well, uh, they're not Deutsche Bank. They seem to be doing pretty well right now. They are, and it was a pretty big shocker. This is the this was the beginning of the earnings season in the U.S., uh, Started off the week uh, with poor numbers uh, from the uh, Alcoa and uh, ended up the week on just the opposite with just fabulous numbers from U.S. banks. And it was pretty much across the board, Bank of America, Citicorp, J.P. Morgan, Morgan Stanley, you know, you've got 30 to 40 percent revenue growth, which is just unheard of. Um, and uh, coming right on the heels of uh, all the Brexit problems we had at the beginning of the quarter. So um, they've they've done very, very well. And those stocks, you know, if we take a look at sector rotation and what's been happening here, the um, all of these U.S. banks broke out of some very, very nice bases late in the spring. And uh, then with Brexit, um, they... They pulled back to their breakouts. Then during the summer, they established higher lows once again. So this is this is a sector that I think people should be taking a very serious look at, buying on corrections, uh, and in particular when you're in the latter stages of the economic cycle, uh, or in a well, well. Uh, uh, when you're in the latter stages of an economic cycle, this is one of the sectors that you want to be into. And uh, the other one would be the technology, that would be information technology. And with what is going on in terms of wages right now, um, the the move to have the lower income individuals uh, uh, receive higher wages, the the problem is that Corporations take a serious look at capital expenditures, and if they can see that they can substitute capital for labor, they're going to do that. And right now, the information technology boom, I think, is similar in a way to what we saw in the late 1990s, and I wouldn't be at all surprised that this is a sector that really leads us through the next um, calendar quarter or two. So many people were critical of the bank situation, I know, just six months ago. What happened to turn it around? Well, with with any of these items, uh, public perception is one thing and public opinion. But what we have had happen here is that interest rates are are the key item as far as the banks are concerned. And uh, regardless of what they want to do in terms of incentives for having people open accounts and do things, it's that spread that they're making, the differential between what they, they're they borrowing at and what they're uh, able to uh, lend out at. And right now, the bond market topped out right at the first week of July and has been trending down. Uh, this is a, a you know foreshadowing what we're going to end up seeing with the Fed in December, invariably going to raise interest rates and follow along what's happening in the open market. But it's that spread differential that's starting to help the banks. Uh, we also see that in Canada. I mean, you take a look at these major Canadian banks. Uh, they are up at the best levels of the year and in some cases testing all-time highs. Now, of course, you wouldn't want to be a European banker right now. 
No. Uh, the, uh, the problems over there could just continue to mount and, uh, re you know, eventually I would suspect that uh, when, when some of the fines have been paid by Deutsche Bank, etc., that you'll be looking at some, you know, pretty good interim lows. But for anyone who's looking for a serious uh, long-term position, you want to stay away from there. And e even hedging off on the currencies, whether it be on uh, the euro or the British pound, that's that's only going to make it a, a break-even uh, proposition. So I think better off to stay in North America. Gold lately has been down, but is that trend going to continue? Well, you know, we did have the break when we were hoping for. And uh, one thing that I have been looking at and talked about in the past uh, is the, uh, the eight-year cycle, which we are right now just sitting on the anniversary of uh, the last eight-year low in 2008. Um, typically, what you would have is a um, a low in this time window uh, into October, sometimes early November. You thrash around for a few weeks, have a short-term rally, and then by out into January, February, you will have put in the important low and then start to move well. I like the action that we're seeing right now. We're starting to stabilize here. It's been, I think, 10 days. Uh, that prices have been stuck in this 1250 to 1260 range. Uh, you know, another another little bit here, possibly up to test resistance in the 1287 to 1295 area. Uh, if we back off from there and then subsequently turn through that in the coming months, I think you've got the opportunity for a pretty good move uh, in uh, the first half of next year. Even if people don't get the bottom of the gold market, if you start to do averaging, you're probably going to do well. Yeah, I mean, well, there's a point at which you have to start stepping in, and most of the uh, the stocks are down a good 25 to 30 percent off their highs. They're starting to hold in, and what I would hope for is that the next time that we see bullion prices come under pressure, and you know that that's probably a you know a number of weeks down the road after we've had an attempted rally. You want to take a look for the stocks that are starting to hold up the best or the ones that managed to put on new highs in September while others were failing. So take a look for the, the internal strengths. Don't look to buy the cheapest ones that are out there. Look to buy the ones that are most resilient. Ross, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money. It's good to be with you, Jim. My guest has been Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC with Gundy in Vancouver. Coming up. Martin Armstrong, next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. My guest is Martin Armstrong, founder of Armstrong Economics. It's available online at armstrongeconomics.com. He's speaking to us from Florida. Martin, welcome back to This Week in Money. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. Well, uh, first of all, if you're in Florida, I hope you're okay after Hurricane Matthew marched through the territory. Yeah, I was actually swimming in the morning. I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing really happened. I was on the West Coast. Lucky you. Martin, you have a conference coming up in November. Please tell us about it. Um, well, this is our annual uh, World Economic Conference. And uh, they've become over the years like a mini UN. It's, it's, everybody flies in from all over the place. And... Uh, so a lot of them are, you know, it's kind of like a, almost like a, a college reunion to some degree. But we are going over the entire world. Um, we go over all the various different economies and, and, and largely show what, how everything really correlates. I think the biggest problem in analysis really is that you have people that 
you know, just do one specific market or whatever. They really are not paying attention to everything globally, and it's all connected. Um, our models are like, it's really quite amazing, but I mean, if I just posted on the, on the blog, one on the, on the Russian ruble, and it shows the same time periods, November and January, that the Dow shows, and gold, and so it's like everything is correlating to the same thing at this point. It seems to be more of a international event that's, that's, uh, taking place and a lot of it is uh, clearly you know it looks like we're, we're headed probably towards a, some sort of a direct confrontation with Russia well let's take a look at the US election the battle between Trump and Hillary the American people are extremely polarized in this election what are you hearing that's largely the press uh, the, the press is um, it, it's kind of like the same thing I saw in Britain. All the press was was against Brit exit. Oh, you know, you're gonna the country will collapse, etc. Et the darkest possible scenarios, and every newspaper was in favor of of staying and surrendering all sovereignty to Brussels. And the polls were rigged and everything else, and it got everybody so angry, there was a huge surge, and they came out and they voted exit. And in the United States, we're seeing the very same patterns. 99% virtually of all newspapers have endorsed Hillary. But the interesting thing is, is that, I mean, um, when you look at the donations, Trump leads Hillary in individual donations by nearly three million. And although he's only raised about a hundred and fifty million on average, Hillary has more than a half a billion. But her money is coming from hedge funds, bankers, lobbyists, all the elite. And so when Hillary goes and has a speech, I mean they focus the cameras in close because the places are not full. Um, and I, it's it's really amazing. But Hillary's disapproval rating, as far as they don't trust her, they think she's dishonest, is 63%. I mean, the highest any president ever won of a popular vote was about 61 and a half, and that was Johnson after the JFK assassination, a sympathy vote. Uh, Nixon got a little over 60, so did FDR and Warren Harding. Other than that, everybody else is pretty much in that 52, 54% range. So, I mean, this is an extraordinary uh, election, and, and it's kind of, it's very disappointing because I think it's nowhere but downhill from here. I mean, honestly... What they've done to Trump digging up, you know, uh, some comments and tapes from, you know, 20 years ago or whatever, it, it's very significant because who in their right mind would even want to run for, for such an office today? Um, if this is what, what it is, then they're really deterring other people. It's got nothing to do with, are you qualified to run the country? Or, oh, did you say something that we found offensive 20 years ago? Um, I mean, there's plenty of things that Hillary said offensive. I mean, it's got not necessarily really anything that's to do with um, qualifications. But this is what it's come down to. And if you go back to JFK, I mean, yeah, behind the curtain, everybody knew he had plenty of affairs and girls coming in and out, Marilyn Monroe and whatever, but it was never in the press. Everybody said, yeah, that's what's going on, but you didn't talk about it. Today, they talk about absolutely everything. So, um, I find it very disheartening in the sense that uh, looking forward, I mean, who would ever really want to run for, for an election like this? What is peak government, and are we experiencing it now? Yeah, I think that's part of the the big problem that you know that 
people are, are to a large extent delusional. They think uh, voting for a president actually changes everything. I mean, if you look at Obama when he was running the first time, he stood up, he said, oh, NSA, that's unconstitutional, Bush is, is terrible, and, and Guantanamo Bay, you should be giving these people trials, they're not getting trials. Everything he said that was negative against Bush, he has done. Why? It's largely because, he, you know, they say, here, here's your golf cubs, go have a nice time. Because the people who are running the NSA and the rest of them were the very same people under Bush continue to run it under Obama. So they are the unelected, you know, underbelly, so to speak. So, I don't know, are we just living in, in a delusional world that we think that, you know, everybody gets all riled up about these elections? Oh, you know, how can you vote for Trump or how can you vote for Hillary? Do you really think this is going to change something? Populist movements versus globalists with protectionism rising around the planet and trade agreements in jeopardy. Has China had its so-called day in the sun and is manufacturing likely to return to North America? Um, probably not. I mean, if Trump were to actually uh, do what he said he would do and they would allow him to do it, uh, yes, then it can come back. But quite frankly, just look at it this way. If, if one car dealer sells a car at full sticker price and one in the next town over will give you 10% off, where are you going to go buy? You know, and it, it's just simple as that. And, you know, for all this nonsense, all of the corporations, and, and they, they put the tax up high so they don't bring the money back. Okay. So you have almost three trillion dollars in cash of corporations sitting offshore, and they don't even bring it back because it would be, you know, taxed, you know, excessively. So, uh, you know, Trump's proposal of lowering the corporate tax to fifteen percent, and he said it would all come home, is absolutely correct. It's just common sense. But um, I mean, I'm against corporate. And, and personal income tax anyhow. It, it's these things are are barbaric relics from the past. I mean, what they collect in taxes, we still have deficits that run three, four, five times that amount. And they're printing the money anyhow. So what is the point you know, the point here? We used to need taxes when it was like gold coin or something. All right, fine, we need some back to pay again. But you don't do that anymore. You, you just basically, you, you effectively just create the money. So if you're just creating the money, why do you need to, all this constant harassing of, of people back and forth for, for taxes at the federal level? I mean, taxes at local level, fine. They need that because they can't create the money. But at the federal level, they create it. It's it's really a waste of time. It's like taking twenty dollars from your left pocket, putting it in your right pocket, and then you moving it back to your left again. Uh, <laughs> what are you doing? Is the U.S. now a fascist country? Sure, I think that any republic. The problem with a republic is the worst form of government. It always ends up being an oligarchy. Um, and people don't quite understand it. They, I mean, they, they put these labels on that we all live in a democracy. If it's, you know, U.S., Canada, Europe, whatever, we do not live in democracies. Uh, a democracy is, is not like this. And you have a direct right to vote. In, in Greece, you know, and people misunderstand this, why women didn't have the right to vote. But also, nobody else in the household, other than the head of the household, voted. He represented, like a congressman, per se, everybody that was in the house. All right, he would go down and say, yes, okay, fine, this, that, or the other. And then he would go home. A republic, you lose that direct control. What happens is you elect somebody for the entire city. Okay, and then... Somebody else comes and they bribe him, and then next thing you know, he's passing laws, whatever, you know, he's ever going to pay him the most. So, 
so there's no direct thing, and they call it democracy. It's not, and, you know, it's it's a republic. So, but <clears throat> it's a republic that generates uh, career politicians, where a democracy does not. So, unfortunately, this is this is what the West is, and they call it themselves. Oh, we live in democratic principles, which is complete nonsense. Is Trump part of the establishment or against the establishment? Um, I would say this whole election process, because it's not just in the United States. This is everywhere. And I'm seeing this, you know, this is what Brit Exit was about. And you're seeing it in France, that Holland is below 10% in polls. Merkel, her party, the CDU, has lost the three, three major elections, even in Berlin. I mean, they <clears throat> out of touch with, with the people, uh, and so it is. It, even Trump, I mean, if you look at what this basically is, the number of individuals are donating to Trump versus Hillary. So it is the people versus the establishment, but it's just on a global scale. Immediately following the election and long term, will the markets care who the president elect is? Well, I mean, markets largely will always gyrate around this particular issue, but at the end of the day, it's markets move in anticipation. They don't really move because of a fundamental event. So they move pretty much if you think something's going to happen, it will happen. This is why in trading we've always had that uh, that saying, you know, buy the rumor and sell the news. Uh if you think there's going to be a war, then you're going to basically act in response to it. And um, in, in Japan, when they were going to raise the, the sales tax dramatically, it looked as though, you know, for the first time that, that the Japanese economy recovered. Everybody ran out and they bought at whatever they anticipated buying to save money before the tax went into play. So, I mean, we're not... You know, drones, um, like, you know, R2-D2 or something in Star Wars. Or, it's, it, you know, people do act in anticipation of what they think might happen. We'll have more with Martin Armstrong next on This Week in Money. Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa. Located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange. Symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. You're listening to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. We're speaking with Martin Armstrong of Armstrong Economics. Martin, is the Clinton Foundation being fairly targeted for the way it operates? Oh, the Clinton Foundation is an absolute money laundering scam. Um, it's a joke, a complete joke. I mean, just ask yourself, this. I mean, uh, I published a piece on Norway. Why did Norway end up, you know, giving all this money to the Clinton Foundation? Then Obama ends up getting the Nobel Prize, uh, Peace Prize, and then the head of Norway, all right, after donating this, he then is appointed the head of NATO. I mean, you have Saudi Arabia you know, donating money to to uh, Hillary. And, and the WikiLeaks basically have just revealed emails showing that even she admitted that they were funding ISIS. So, um, all right, Saudi Arabia is against effectively women's rights, and they're against gays. They will even execute them. So why would they be donating to something that supposedly is for women's rights and gays? It just makes no sense. You know, but who's going to really investigate something like this? Because, you know, they're all just sitting there licking their chops and, and, you know, you have now 
evidence that has come out that Obama knew all about it, and he used a fake name in communicating with Hillary because it went through the servers. So, I mean, they all know what's going on. Is the U.S. mainstream media biased in this election, and could it affect their business and bottom lines going forward? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, look, you have 99% basically have come out and endorsed Hillary. Even newspapers that first, like the New York Times that came out and exposed what she was doing with the emails. They uncovered a number of things. Then, okay, how do you then endorse her? Um, so you endorse somebody that has actually done criminal acts that anybody else would be in prison for because Trump speaks off the top of his, his head? I mean, that doesn't really make much sense. But, um, you know, the media is bought and paid for. They're, it's really corporate. So, they're, you know, they just put out the uh, the word. That's it. And the same thing you saw in Britain. Uh, it, it's, it's just the way it is. In Germany, all the the press there kept h- trying to hide all the uh, rapes that that were taking place because it would make Merkel look bad. Only when foreign press started reviewing what was going on, they had a you know oh yeah gee sorry about that we sh- we 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 were still investigating. Do you expect significant social unrest in the U.S. following the election, and are there markets that would benefit from that? Well, I think that what you're going to do is you're going to see that uh, most likely one of the biggest markets to probably benefit from it will will be the stock market in the U.S. And it's not necessarily uh, a, a view of, you know, corporate earnings and things of this nature. That, that type of analysis is gone. And if you actually, I mean, we put on our chart of the the P.E. ratio and the S&P. And, you know, people go, oh, well, how can the stock market go up? It's The P.E. ratio is around 23. That's historical highs. It's not. The the dot-com bubble, yes, it reached 50. They go, oh, well, that was just a bubble. Okay. 2009. In the crisis where banks were failing, et cetera, nobody knew what was going on, what did the ratio go to? All right? About 120. So that's kind of like interest rates, what they've been doing in Germany where they, they've gone negative on 10-year bonds. Why would somebody be doing that? Largely because they expect the euro to collapse, and by buying the bonds over there, they assume they would get Deutschmarks. So it was a bet against the euro. But why would you be paying, you know, buying things that are negative? And simply, you're parking money. It's not a question of how much am I going to get in a return. Am I going to get my money back at the end of the day? And that's really what it's about. So the stock market, you know, can go, the P.E. ratio can go back to 120, even much higher And it has nothing to do with the underlying economic conditions. It's just that if you cannot trust government, because governments are going to be defaulting and they're going into, you know, we go into wars and and things of this nature, they're just going to turn around and just go into the private sector. I mean, that's effectively what happened even with World War I. And uh, they closed the stock market, you know, but it... This is this is how capital responds. I mean, if you don't trust the government, where you go? There's only one other place. Could the election results ignite gold and silver? Uh, gold and silver. I mean, they're still in a in a uh, position where we're eventually going to go higher, but um, there's still downside risk in short term. But what you have to keep in mind is that I know there's been a lot of hype with gold and silver, et cetera, over the years, but, look, things have changed. I mean, 20 years ago, you could hop, you know, put some gold in a briefcase, hop on a plane, and fly. You can't do that today. They're hunting gold everywhere. I mean, Italy, if it looks like you have too much gold jewelry hanging around your neck, they pull you off and they weigh it. So it's not, you know, the... 
uh, free market means of picking up money and moving it as it used to be before. So major uh, hedge funds or institutions, I mean, they can play the gold stocks or ETFs or something like that, but they're not really interested in taking physical delivery. They can't. And how can you take a, a physical delivery of something that doesn't pay any yield? Your, your, you know, your uh, performance will go to zero. So they need the, the yield. And, um, that's, that's the major distinction. So gold and silver tend to be more of an, in, of a institutional thing in the, uh, stocks or, um, ETFs, things of that nature to trade. As far as physical holding and, and ownership, that tends to be for the individual. Are you more bullish on gold or silver and why? Well, largely gold historically is just simply a hedge against government. It's not a hedge against inflation. I mean, uh, those people that say that sort of thing, I mean, all you gotta look at is look, gold was at 875 in 1980 and it fell to under 300 by 1999. The national debt went from 1 trillion to 6. So, I mean, you can't just ignore things like that. When does gold go up? It goes up when people are concerned about government. That's when it rises. So we're heading into a period like that, and it certainly appears um, beginning in 17, but it looks like going into probably about 2020 to 2023 even. There are some predictions of gold hitting between two thousand and ten thousand dollars an ounce and silver anywhere from a hundred to a thousand an ounce. Your thoughts on that? No, I mean the maximum possible price that our computer would it projects on gold is about five thousand, and for silver, no way for a thousand. Just it's just not possible. Vancouver looks like the poster child for the real estate bubble. Is real estate around the world in trouble, and is credit constricting? Yes. I mean, largely because politicians um, have been going after real estate, and because things have gotten expensive, or uh, and people are complaining that they can't necessarily... Um, you know, buy houses anymore or things of that nature. So you have, you have them doing various types of laws pretty much everywhere. In Britain, they went after the foreign investors and, you know, the real estate collapsed about 15% the first month. Uh, in Australia, they've made it a criminal act for a foreigner to own real estate and not reveal it. Uh, in the United States, the, the two areas where foreign capital was going in aggressively was New York and Miami. Um, and the government, uh, the IRS came in with laws saying that just in those two areas that a title insurance company had to pierce all the corporate veils and reveal who was actually behind buying what. So now Miami real estate is, is, is crashing. Are currency restrictions in China being tightened, affecting real estate prices around the world? Uh, yeah, I mean, China is, is concerned at this point of uh, the capital flight. So you, you do have a lot of people uh, from China that have been trying to get their money out because, you know, from their perspective, they too do not necessarily trust their government. So... Um, I mean, it seems like we're in this position where it's uh, very anti-establishment, per se, on a global scale. After real estate, where is investment money likely to go? Probably equities. Uh, that seems to be the best spot. Um, they're also liquid, so um, unlike real estate, I and mean, if they pass laws and making it punitive to own something or do whatever, the problem then becomes uh, you can't pick it up and move it. So uh, at least stocks, uh, I think, are, are 
a safer bet. They're liquid, and uh, that's that's going to be really the key. Can the bond market bubble and low interest rates continue indefinitely? Now the 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 bond bubble basically is uh, appears to be about over, and it was being pushed up a bit in in uh, Europe, but it wasn't for the yields or, or bonds or, or anything else. It was just largely a currency play that very very negative against uh, the euro. So you had capital flight from other countries, and they were buying the bonds in Germany. It was really just a bet on against the euro. That's that's pretty much it. Um, the Federal Reserve keeps warning that we have to raise interest rates. They have to be normalized. And people don't realize what's going on here. Is But you have um, a pension crisis, which is really monumental. And uh, it's just nuts. It's just totally nuts. Well, with all these boomers retiring right now, are their pensions safe? Most of the pensions, I would say, particularly uh, government pensions, are are definitely not safe. And um, there are some that, I mean, um, that are better than others. But, I mean, I would just, you know, pay attention to to some of them. I mean, there is one big one in Canada that, that um, I've met with. And uh, they were, you know, they changed management. And uh, they more or less adopted what our models were saying. They got rid of all government debt. And uh, they moved to, to private and S&P went in and said, oh, gee, you're taking on more risk. And they said, look, you know, this is what Armstrong's saying. We did our own due diligence, and he's right. No real double-A AA or triple-A company ever really went went bust. Governments always do. They take haircuts. They You don't get your money back. Why people buy government bonds is beyond me. We hear a number of people are calling a top on the Dow and the S&P are these markets climbing a so-called wall of worry, and are you bullish or bearish going forward? No, bullish. I mean, you know, those people are, they don't really do their homework because they're just looking at things on a domestic level. All right, if the stock market's going to crash, where do you put your money? Traditionally, you run into bonds. So what are you going to do? You're going to go to, to the bond market and tell the government here, I want to buy some more bonds, and don't worry, just give me 90 cents on the dollar back. I don't think so. Um, it's the market is going sideways. You don't see a big bubble spike high like you did in the dot com bubble or J- Japan 19, you know, uh, 89 or whatever. You don't 1929 US. You don't see that phase transition type high. That's a classic sign of a bubble. They just keep looking at the high, all of the levels, it's got to go down, and they keep shorting this thing, and that's why it runs back up again, because they get stopped out every time. This market's just basing, and then it's going to it's gonna take off, and, and this is what you need. I mean, the majority always have to be wrong, so the fuel that takes it up are all these people that keep saying, oh, it's a major high. Are places like Japan and Europe condemning banks, insurance companies, and pension funds to doom with their negative interest rates? Oh, absolutely. This is the next major crisis. It's it's uh, it's the pension crisis that pensions basically were designed that they needed eight percent to break even, and then why well, I'm also very negative on interest rates and 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 pensions in particular. You have many countries, even in Switzerland, all right, they, a pension fund must have 85% government debt. Oh, to be safe and protect the people. Uh, in the United States, Social Security goes bust next year. 100% invest in government debt. And so there's no possible way that you can deal with this crisis because they're not allowed to actually invest people's money. Do you see any markets that are in the process of bottoming? 
Oh, I think, you know, we're looking, you know, we're still a little premature, but I think like metals and some commodities, things of this nature. And the stock market is effectively coiling. Runs up, runs back down, runs up, runs back down. It's not necessarily um, making any major um, disruptions. I mean, if we get a war that begins with Russia as early as November, uh, sure, you can get a correction out of it, and then it would be a, a knee-jerk reaction down, saying, oh, my God, there's war, and then it will flip around and say, oh, well, wait a minute, war is better, so it will then turn around and go back, back, go back up. So you still can get some very nice spikes in this, you know, back and forth. But um, effectively, when you look across the globe, what are we looking at? We're looking at capital is confused. It knows something that is wrong. Uh, it can't necessarily put its finger on it, but this is what is happening. And everybody's like, you know, moving back and forth, and what, what am I doing next? And this is why we've called it the year from political hell, because we have four elections that can absolutely turn the world upside down. First was Brit exit. Next is U.S. Uh, elections. Then you have the French elections, and then you have the German. So whatever you see, in France and in in um, Germany, you're looking at right wing coming back. So, and this is this is the fate of the world. Following the greater recession, are we likely to see a greater depression? Oh, sure. I mean, it's our biggest problem here is that the. Um, Government levels of taxation are excessive. The levels of regulation are even more insane. And um, it, it's just something that is is quite dramatic. And we have to really look at this because um, until we, you know, I, I call it crash and burn, there's just really no hope of reversing this. And... Because government is not about to admit a mistake, and this is what keeps going. Going forward, where would you rather live, Canada or the U.S.? Um, well, I picked Florida. <laughs> um, mainly because uh, the two states in the U.S., which are have the best possible laws for uh, property, etc., are particularly Florida. Um, they have what is down here is called homestead. So even if you you went into bankruptcy, they cannot take your house. They got to wait for you to die. Overall, as um, a country, where should a person live, Canada or the U.S.? Well, it's it going to basically depend, I think, um, where you're at, and if you're looking at geopolitical stuff, etc. Canada, you're getting into insane levels of taxation. Same way like in California. I mean, you're over, you're, you know, you're really approaching 65% over there. I mean, that's nuts. Uh, and <clears throat> so as far as safe is, is concerned, I mean, if you move up north away from the cities, you're fine. Or you move down south in the U.S., Away from the main financial centers, etc., you're you're probably better off too. But you don't want to live in uh, Toronto or New York or something like that. When you go into the voting booth on the eighth, who are you casting your ballot for, and why? It's, um, I don't know. I would have to say probably uh, if. I'm going to have to, if I were to have to vote for somebody, I probably would vote for Trump, mainly just to really get Washington uh, all upset. <laughs> That's about it. Uh, I don't think that if he does win, and our computer does show that he should win, but, you know, that's going to be, will they allow him to, to actually win, or are they going to rig the whole election? And it's looking more like rigging rather than any, anything else. But um, <clears throat> regardless of who wins, uh, I would say by 2018 is what we're really looking at. And 
we're probably going to see at that stage in the game a uh, a complete more or less turnover of Congress. Uh, our problem is is that you have a lot of these um, elites that are there, and they're just getting so old they should get the heck out. I mean, just people like John McCain, you know. I mean, I mean, honestly, you know, it's just it's just too much. And um, until we get fresh blood in there, uh, we're not going to really see anything significant as far as uh, changing anything. I don't think uh, Trump would be able to change the direction of the economy or something like that. I'm not really. Republican or Democrat, because I really don't believe in either party. But um, I, I do think that if Trump got in, it, it would be a warning signal to them, kind of like Brit exit, that either you clean up your act or by 2018, you're all out. Martin, how can people find out more about Martin Armstrong Economics? Uh, well, you can go to our website, uh, armstrongeconomics.com. That's probably the best place to start. I mean, that's, uh, we don't put advertisement on there or charge people. It's, we do it as a public service. And, uh, hopefully that enough people understand what is really going on on a global scale. Then we can push back, perhaps. Um, but that's, that's the only hope. I mean, I'd like to leave a world a little bit better for, my grandkids than what I rent, what we inherited. Martin, thanks for being on This Week in Money. Well, thank you for inviting me. My guest has been Martin Armstrong, founder of Armstrong Economics, his website, armstrongeconomics.com. Coming up, Peyton Nyquist, next on This Week in Money. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. We're speaking with Peyton Nyquist. He's a Vancouver investment advisor at MackeyResearch.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Peyton. Thanks for having me. What happened on the Toronto Stock Exchange this past week? The Toronto Stock Exchange had a high of 14724 Low was 14477 uh, closing around 14,590, so this week was down about 21 points. Was there any particular sector that got hit? Uh, nothing in particular, you know, it really kind of flat this week. There's been, you know, the re- the resource stuff continues to be a bit up and down, um, so I, I don't think that really anything in particular. What's going on with Canada's junior markets? The uh, venture had a high of 782, low was 768, uh, closing at 773, so pretty much flat uh, on the week this week. And the Canadian Stock Exchange, the CSC, had a high of 796, low was 776, closing at 793, uh, so up about seven points for the week this week. Now, again, I noticed the Venture Exchange on days when the major exchanges are down. The Venture Exchange still manages to keep its head above water. Yeah, you know, it, it continues to keep its resiliency. The The resource market's been, uh, as I was saying, it's been a bit soft. But, uh, but interestingly enough, and I know we've talked about this at length, but uh, when the resource market's been soft, the marijuana business has been flying. So uh, that's kind of been helping lead the charge there i think well the major banks at least the royal bank is one of them has avoided uh financing marijuana operations yet we know it's going to be legal how long will the big banks stay away from financing marijuana you know it, it's interesting I, I saw something about td doing the same um the, they're kind of staying away from it but I, I i do think that the trains left the station there you know i think when there's some some really good clarity on the government side of things, 
that's when you'll you'll start to see that interest kind of peak up from the banks. And of course, there's always concern marijuana won't be legal in Canada until just a year or two before the next election, and I can imagine the Conservatives would not be pro pot. Well, that's been the other you know side of the coin too. Is is you know it's not like this is some small legislation they're trying to change. This is a very major undertaking. Well, the only problems I've heard about with pot in Colorado and Washington State is that they haven't been able to keep up with the demand. Yeah, it, the demand's been huge. You know, I know they've had issues with banking down there and that they have to operate on a cash system um, because they've had hard times getting bank accounts open. But, I, you know, I think the probably the approach that Canada would have because it's got to go legal Canada-wide, uh, I think it'll be much different in terms of how it's taxed, how it's banked, um, probably controls on how it's sold. If they're looking at what happened in Colorado, you know, they've got a pretty good blueprint on what to do and what not to do uh, going forward. Peyton, thank you so much for chatting with us. Great. Thanks for having me. My guest has been Peyton Nyquist, a Vancouver investment advisor at MackeyResearch.com. That wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Martin Armstrong, and Peyton Nyquist. And thank you for listening. Questions for the show can be emailed to info at HowStreet.com. Coming up right after this, Company Showcase with CEO and President of American Manganese, Larry Ray. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. We're speaking to American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray on October 15th. Larry, you just put out a news release for American Manganese, and the numbers were quite nice. Well, it's an exciting release and a, definitely one of the turning points in the company. Um, you know, it was titled, uh, it announces X-ray diffraction results from upcycled cathode, cathode material. And uh, the contents are really telling you something. It's uh, the material that we actually uh, uh, reclaimed from the recycled material that we leached and then we precipitated out uh, uh, lithium, lithium ion cobalt material and we got a hundred percent recoveries on those so that is a very high number as a matter of fact the comparison that we used was a uh, cathode material that was supplied by one of the commercial suppliers and uh, they were at 97 percent purity and we were at a hundred percent what does that mean the purer the product the, the less chance uh, much less chance you have of uh, battery fires or explosions. So, you know, we could actually probably take cathode material that is produced uh, by these uh, companies that sell the cathode material to the battery manufacturers, and we could probably uh, clean that up and purify it, which would make a much safer battery. But that's not the business we're going into. We're looking at producing uh, cathode material from spent electro electric vehicle batteries and uh, being able to uh, resell that back to the manufacturer. And when I say that, it's uh, we, the, high, the purity is very important. So we've uh, shown that we can get a high purity. And the last step that we have to take is to produce the uh, rechargeable, button cell batteries and uh, you know that's key I mean you if your cathode material will not take a charge then uh, then you've uh, you've got some kind of a flaw in the system but when you got a hundred percent material um, I'm sure that we can that we'll be successful on that we've moved through the process of our proof of concept 
and uh, we're nearing the end of it. Um, you know, we got uh, 100% recoveries in the leaching. We got the uh, lower recoveries in the uh, precipitation because we didn't do all the lock cycle tests. Uh, we just wanted to produce powder because, uh, you know, time is money uh, when you're spending money on research. And uh, we wanted to get the uh, cathode material out through precipitation and ready for testing. But before testing, you have to make sure that it's got a, it's, what its purity is, and that's what the X-ray diffraction is all about. And uh, those results today are showing that we got 100%. So, you know, that's a high pure, high purity cathode product. And, um, you know, the I couldn't be happier about the results. This is turning out much the way we thought it would. What's that mean for the company? Now uh, it opens many doors once the proof of concept's done. Uh, the uh, senior companies out there in the battery manufacturing or the electric vehicle manufacturing or recycling uh, will start looking at us uh, in a much more serious fashion. And we're looking for a partner, uh, whether it's a uh, battery manufacturer or a uh, EV uh, company or a uh, recycler or, you know, it could be somebody wanting to break into the electric vehicle space uh, in another avenue. Uh, we already see Google and Apple and uh, oil companies that are doing this. So, you know, the vista is wide open. It's a great spot to be in. Larry, how rare is a 100% discovery? That is 100% recovery, 100% purity of the product. And, uh, which is, uh, you know, basically there's nothing else with it. So it's 100% recovery, yes. And, uh, you know, that's what you're, that's what you strive to do. You strive to get the best recovery you can. And uh, to be able to recycle this material so you have a circular economy and you don't have to have it ending up in a smelter being burnt up or a landfill or some toxic waste uh, storage area, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a solution out there uh, for many, many things. And I think chief among them is, uh, I know we talk about lithium being in short supply, but nobody's... You know, people are talking now about cobalt being in short supply. And uh, cobalt is definitely uh, high on the list, uh, at least with us, uh, because there's more cobalt in the battery than there is lithium, uh, quite a bit more. There's 60% cobalt, 4% lithium. And uh, cobalt is now about $27,000 a ton, which, uh, you know, makes it a very attractive uh for example, Tesla, if uh, one of their uh, uh, Model S's has a uh, lithium-ion ba cobalt battery in it, uh, the uh, actual amount of cobalt is about 55 kilograms. And uh, so you take 55 kilograms, that's twelve fifty, uh, you know, at $25 a kilogram or whatever, um, you know, you've got, uh, you know, $1,200. $1,300 just in cobalt in that one battery that may weigh up, uh, up to a 1,000 pounds. And uh, so you can see where I'm going with this is uh, it would be great to recycle that material. Uh, cobalt is a byproduct. Most of it's produced from byproduction. And uh, it will be in short supply. And uh, we'd like to be able to fill that gap. Larry, the number of cars sold in China every day is tremendous. What is the latest number you've heard? And even if 1% of that becomes electric in the near term, that's a lot of batteries to sell. The last number I saw was about 25,000 a day. That's a humongous amount of vehicles hitting the market. We're interested in the, the uh, batteries that have the chemistry of lithium cobalt or lithium Nickel, manganese, cobalt, or lithium, cobalt, aluminum. Those chemistries are the ones we want to focus on. Why? Well, the, uh, when you get down to uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries, uh, 
you know, the byproduct of that, the product of the cathode material, doesn't have a lot of value. And, uh, you know, if you can't make money, then you can't, uh, you can't proceed to, uh, you know, be a good recycler. So, uh, you know, that's the ones we're focusing on. And, uh, certainly, uh, China has a lot of that, but they have a lot of, uh, iron phosphate you know, lithium ion phosphate batteries too. So uh, that's an area we haven't covered. One we may look at uh, once we get the process down and everything else, it could uh, it could become economical. Uh, but at this stage, the real money is in uh, lithium cobalt, lithium nickel manganese cobalt, which are the popular batteries out there. Larry, where can people find out more about American manganese? Well, they can go to uh, our uh, website, which is AmericanManganeseInc.com. They can definitely phone me here at my offices at 778-574-4444. Or they can email me at lray, R-E-A-U-G-H, at A-M-Y, Amy, M-N, MotherNorman.com. And what's your stock symbol? Our symbol is a is amy dot b. We're also listed in uh, on the uh, pink sheets in the U.S. at amy zf, and uh, we're listed in uh, Frankfurt as two uh, m. Larry, thanks for updating us. Okay, you're welcome. I'm Jim Goddard. We were speaking with American Manganese CEO and President Larry Ray on October fifteenth. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.